This morning, as I've already told you, we're continuing in the Gospel of John. We're going to be looking at a, a parallel passage, the one I've already read in, in Matthew 14. And this text actually contains things that the other text doesn't have, which is why it's often helpful to read the different accounts and to see what it is that makes up the, the entirety of that account. But we do need to realize that the gospel writers, through the inspiration of the Spirit, chose the particular elements that they did to include in their account for a specific reason, and we don't want to uh, neglect that as well. So there's a reason why certain elements are left out and certain ones are included in each of these accounts because of what it is the gospel writers were seeking to convey. Well, in this case, we're going to read uh, John's Gospel in chapter 6, verses 15 through 21. Uh, we're going to leave one of the elements for this evening, and we are going to induct some other elements from Matthew 14 that at least will enhance our understanding of what John is trying to tell us or show us here. So let's go ahead and read the text, and then we'll get into the passage. We read beginning in verse 15. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now remember, this, this follows on the fact Jesus fed the 5,000 and they said, this is the prophet, this is the Messiah. They have their understanding of who the Messiah is and what he was supposed to be, so here they wanted to take him by force to make him king. Now we pick up in verse 16. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. So they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. And again, I just want to uh, encourage each of us through this particular text. This is a trial the disciples had to face. And it shows us not only the reality of trials, but also what our Lord Jesus does to help us uh, in these trials. Now, I've already mentioned that last time we were looking at one of Jesus' most familiar miracles and perhaps the greatest that he had done to this point. Jesus fed the 5,000 men, besides the women and children who were there, with the modest lunch of a young lad who had five barley loaves and two fish. And I just want to remind you that he did it for at least three reasons. First of all, to provide for the needs of his people. I mean, after all, they had followed him, and he had, he had taught them throughout the day. He had healed them of their afflictions. He didn't want to just simply now leave them without meeting this need as well. Jesus cares for his people. He cares for his sheep. He provides for their needs. And let me just say that the same thing is true today. Jesus has promised to each one of us who trust him that he will provide for us throughout life and he will keep us and bring us safely to heaven. We're going to see more about that this morning. Uh, secondly, he did this to show his disciples that there is a reward for serving him. The disciples set, a, set aside their own hunger in order to be servants to the people. Jesus broke the bread and the fish. He gave them these things to his disciples. The disciples fed the people, and then Jesus commanded them following this particular miracle, gather up the, the fragments, gather up what's left over. And they did, and we're told that it filled 12 large baskets. In other words, 5,000 men besides women and children were not only fed, but there was more left over than what they actually began with, 12 large baskets, one for each of his disciples. That was basically their reward for serving the Lord and serving the people and doing what the Lord commanded them to do. Um, it reminds us that if we will do what the Lord calls us to do, if we will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that there is a reward for us as well. 
There's no way we can outgive the Lord. He always blesses us above and beyond what it is we, we do. By the way, I can't help but think that uh, Jesus gave them these, each of them, a, a big basket of food because of all the rowing that they were going to be doing in <laughs> just a few minutes. But he also did this to show both his disciples and the people who were there who it is that he really was. The prophet that Moses said God would raise up and send into the world whom the Jews understood to be the Messiah. Jesus likely did this miracle as we saw during the time of the Passover to show that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But also he did a miracle with bread to show that he is the bread of life because that is what he's going to key in on in just actually the next, the next week as we see the people cross over to follow Jesus and Jesus begins to apply this miracle of the loaves and of the fish. During the time of the Passover was also the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It lasted for a week and during that time they ate nothing but unleavened bread to remind them that they need to withdraw from sin, purify their lives from sin, even as our Lord Jesus Christ is sinless. He is the one pictured by the unleavened bread which is broken for us. Jesus perhaps did this miracle with bread at this time to point out the fact too that he is the bread of life, <clears throat> the one who takes away the sins of the world, who, whom if you eat this bread, in other words, if you trust him, if you turn from your sins and rely upon him alone to get you into heaven, that he will save you, he will forgive you, he will become to you a source of spiritual nourishment. He will give you eternal life. Now we see Jesus command his disciples to get into a boat. We don't actually see that command here, but we did see it in Matthew chapter 14. And to cross the sea again to Capernaum, which we're told in Matthew 14 actually, is in the land of Gennesaret. Now Jesus did this because it was here that he was going to follow up on this miracle. It was here he was going to give his bread of life discourse. Remember we, we said that John is basically pulling together elements of Jesus' life that the other gospel writers really don't mention. Sort of filling in the gaps. But he does mention this particular miracle of the loaves and the fish because of this, this great uh, well discourse, this teaching that Jesus is going to give on the bread of life, which is why John includes that. But then the bread of life discourse we find only in John. So Jesus, of course, is telling them to cross over because he knows it's there. He's going to uh, teach them on the subject. But he also did this because there were certain things he wanted to teach his disciples, again, on the Sea of Galilee. So this morning, I want us to consider those things he taught them and I want us to consider ourselves to be taught the same thing. That's why these things were written down, so that we, who would live many years later, would also learn these same lessons. And what are those lessons? Well, first of all, that Jesus protects us from temptation. Secondly, that the path of duty is often difficult. Thirdly, that Jesus prays for us in our difficulties. Fourthly, that as we grow, the trials become more intense. Fifthly, that the Lord often sends trials after times of blessing. Sixthly, that the Lord will come to us in our trials. And then lastly, that he will use our trials to bring us to the desired destination. And let me just tell you ahead of time, even though there are seven points, I'm not intending on going on forever, each point will be brief. <clears throat> First of all, the Lord protects us from temptation. We read in verse 15, so Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, why did Jesus withdraw to the mountain? Well, we read in, in Matthew's gospel uh, that he did so because he wanted to pray, but he also did so so that the Jews would not attempt to force him to become their king and likely to help the disciples overcome the same temptation. Now we do need to understand like the rest of Israel, the disciples had the expectation that when Messiah came, that he was going to be a political leader. He was the one who was going to lead the Jews to victory over the Romans and throw off, as it were, the Roman yoke. 
As a matter of fact, the disciples still believe this all the way up to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Remember the question that they asked Jesus before he ascended into heaven? Lord, is it this time that you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? What they meant by that was, are you going to throw off the Roman yoke now and set Israel free? Well, Jesus didn't answer that question because it, it wasn't time, that wasn't his purpose. We're going to see this evening that the kingdom that he came to bring is quite a bit different than the one that they expected. So, was he going to do it at this time? Was he going to lead them to to victory? Well, this miracle that Jesus had just done, all this teaching, all this healing, uh, all this feeding of the 5,000 could not have done anything but strengthen their hope that that is what he was about to do. And so Jesus withdrew. He withdrew from the Jews. He commanded his disciples to go to the other side of the lake. And he withdrew to the mountain by himself alone to pray but also to help his disciples overcome this temptation to do what the Jews wanted to do as well, which was to raise him up as a king and, and send him against the Romans, as it were. Now, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now, this morning we're looking at trials, but we need to understand that temptations are just as much trials as difficulties are. God allows them, and he allows them in our lives for some good. But we see that he's never going to allow us in these trials, if it happens to be a temptation, to be tempted beyond what we are able to endure by his grace. He will, though, sometimes push us to the limits in order to stretch us, in order to strengthen us. We do need to remember that everything the Lord brings into our lives, he intends for some good. And so in this case, the Lord was showing the disciples the open door to resist the temptation to make him king. He sent them across the sea to the other side so that they wouldn't get caught up in the crowd's mentality. Again, the Lord provides open doors for us as well to escape the temptations that we also have to face. Second, our Lord shows us that the path of duty is not always easy. It is very often difficult. We read in verses 16 through 18, now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Now let's not forget, Jesus is the one who told his disciples to get into that boat and to cross over to the other side and they submitted to him, they obeyed. But as they obeyed the Lord, a powerful wind began to blow and the sea became restless and as we're going to see in a moment, it made it difficult for them to make much progress. Uh, they were doing what Jesus commanded them to do. Clearly, they were obeying Jesus and submitting to his will. But as they tried to do what Jesus commanded them to do, it seemed as though nature itself was turning against them. And by the time Jesus comes to them, they're really not going to have made much progress at all. Now, sometimes we tend to think that if we submit to the Lord, if we do His will, if we're doing what God wants us to do, if we're in the place He wants us to be, that we're just going to experience nothing but blessing. I mean, isn't that your expectation? It's often my expectation. That our work is going to be easy that it's going to be productive, everything we do is going to be blessed by the Lord. Sometimes it is. I mean, sometimes the Lord works that way, but it isn't always the case. As a matter of fact, very often, the Lord will make the road difficult. He'll make it seem as though everything is basically turning against us, as he did with his disciples when they crossed the sea. But again, that's because the Lord has something more in mind than just the fruit that he wants us to bear in, in obeying his word. 
in, in doing what it is he calls us to do. He has another purpose. He wants to teach us endurance, the importance of perseverance. I've used this illustration before. You know it to be true. If an athlete, any athlete, regardless of the competition, never challenges himself, if he never pushes himself to work harder than he's already working, he's never going to improve. I mean, basically, that's what CrossFit is all about, right? It keeps pushing you beyond the limits. It keeps stretching you in different ways. And when you do that, it actually does make you stronger than you would be otherwise if you stuck with the same routine. Now, the Lord knows in the same way that if we're always doing the same thing and we're always doing it in the same way, if we never have any challenges to face, any spiritual challenges, we're never going to grow any stronger. We're never going to improve. And that's why the Lord will often place difficulties in our path. As we know, even when we're not seeking the Lord earnestly, even when we're not submitting to Him and obeying, the Lord will also bring those things. And sometimes they just seem to come out of the blue because the Lord is teaching us to seek Him and to do so diligently and he wants us to grow stronger. That is a part, by the way, of, of his instruction. We think of instruction as, I read the word of God and now I know. Well, that's not all the Lord has in store for us. It's not just read it and know it, but here it is, experience it, and then grow through it. That's how the Lord works. Now, thirdly, Jesus shows us in this text that he prays for us in our difficulties, and again, uh, I'll read for you verse 15. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now I said a few moments ago that one of the reasons Jesus went up to the mountain was to pray, and we see that in Matthew 14, verse 23. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening... He was there alone. Now, what was Jesus praying for? Well, you know, our Lord, uh, he was undoubtedly praying for many different things. Certainly that the Father would continue to bless him and strengthen him in the work he had given him to do. Certainly that the Lord would strengthen his disciples and help them to grow into the men they needed to be so that they could uh, continue to advance his kingdom once his work was completed. Uh, certainly he was praying for those who were going to hear their word and his word that the Lord would bring his lost sheep home. But I think it's also likely that he prayed that his father would stir up a strong wind that would make the sea turn against his disciples to slow their progress to the other side. In other words, I think Jesus was praying that the Lord would do, his father would do what was necessary to strengthen his disciples. Now again, we need to understand that that is what our Lord does for the reasons we've already seen. God is the one who brings these trials. They don't just happen to us by accident. Nothing really happens by accident. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 1 verse 11. Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. How many things does God work after the counsel of his will or according to his plan? He works all things. Everything that happens in this world is a part of his plan. Nothing happens by accident. doesn't mean that God makes everything happen. I mean, there is evil in this world. It exists. God allows it to exist, and God uses it for good purposes, but he doesn't make people commit evil. He's not responsible for those acts. The people who commit the evil are responsible, but God uses it. Nothing happens by accident. God is the one who is in control, and the reason why he brings them into this world is really for a couple of different reasons, to lead people to Christ, to strengthen those who are in Christ, and that's what we're focusing on right now. James writes in James 1, verses 2 through 4, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, 
so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, God is the one who brings them. He brings them for good. And so James says, when they happen, when they come into your life, rejoice, be happy because of what God is doing, because of what he's going to work in your life. When's the last time you responded to a trial in that way? When's the last time I responded in that way? We need to understand God's purpose behind it. But now my point is this, that Jesus doesn't just bring the trials into our lives and then just leave us, as it were, to fend for ourselves, to sort of flounder around in the water any more than he left the disciples out on the sea by themselves. He prays for us. That's one of the things I think Jesus was praying for as well, realizing that his disciples are struggling on the sea. He was praying for them. And he prays for us that we might have the strength that we need to endure these trials and to learn from them, to benefit from them. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 33 through 34, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. In other words, part of the ongoing ministry of Jesus Christ is right now at the right hand of God, he is interceding, which means he is praying for you and he is praying for me that we will be able to endure the trials he sends into our lives and that those things will benefit us in the way he intends. Now, fourthly, he shows us that as we grow, the trials become more intense. This isn't the first time the disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee when a storm came up. But the first time they were out there, Jesus was in the boat with them. This time they're out on the sea in the middle of a storm without Jesus. And that by Jesus' command, that by Jesus' express will, that's what Jesus wanted them to be. And what he wanted them to be and what he wanted them to be doing. Now, let me just say this that when we first start out with the Lord, it does seem as though things are easier. It does seem as though the Lord is closer to us and not quite so far away. I think we can sense more of his, of his presence. We can sense more of his blessing because the Lord is allowing us to experience that. He doesn't throw children into the middle of a storm and expect them to fend for themselves. But you see, as we grow in the Lord, we begin to notice some things happening. First of all, it seems sometimes like the Lord withdraws from us. Sometimes it seems like he withholds that comfortable presence that we were used to experiencing before, that sense of nearness that we had. Sometimes it seems like we're having to go through greater difficulties because, as a matter of fact, we are. But the reason why the Lord does this is to teach us something that we need to learn, something that if we don't learn, we will never be able to do what he calls us to do, and that is to walk by faith and not by sight. It's, it's easy to, uh, you know, to walk with the Lord when it's, we sense him all around us and everything is going well. Actually, in a certain sense, it's easier to do that. In another sense, it's more difficult because during times like that, we're more likely to uh, not to seek the Lord and to fall away from him. But the Lord wants us to learn to walk with him in difficulties because what kind of a world do we live in? Do we live in a world that is like the Garden of Eden? No, we live in a world that is full of difficulties and full of trials. We have to grow up. We have to become stronger. We have to learn to take God at his word. We need to learn to trust him, not only when it feels like the Lord is near, but also when he is far away. Now, one thing we need to remember, too, is... Is the Lord ever really far from any one of us? Actually, no, he isn't. It may seem that way, but he's really no further from us than he ever is from us. The Lord is always near us. The Lord says through Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 41 verse 10, and I do believe this is a promise we can apply to ourselves if we're trusting in Jesus. He says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I wonder which hand Jesus reached out and took hold of Peter. Think he was right-handed? 
It doesn't really matter because the righteous right hand of God is his hand of blessing. But when you read this passage, don't you see Peter <laughs> floundering out in the water, sinking, as it were, into the water, and Jesus saying, don't fear, I'm with you. Don't look anxiously about you. I mean, Peter was looking at the storm, the wind, and the waves, and he began to sink. Don't look at those things, Peter. Look at me, Jesus was saying. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Here it is. I'm going to pull you out of the water now. The Lord does exactly the same thing for us. Even though he's not here physically, he is still here spiritually, isn't he? And he's in control of everything that's happening. The Lord can save you, and he will save you. That is his promise. He is never far from any one of us. We simply need to learn to trust him. Now, when is the Lord most likely to send trials? Well, here's our next point. He most often sends them after times of blessing. Now, this takes place in the evening, and it's the evening of the same day that Jesus fed the 5,000. They had just witnessed the greatest miracle that Jesus had done to date and again, they had just, each of them enjoyed a full basket of bread and fish as a reward for their participation. And now, just a few hours later, they find themselves stuck out at sea in the middle of a storm, struggling to row to land. Great blessing followed by great trial. I can't help but think of what Spurgeon told his preaching students in his lectures to his students that in their ministries to the Lord, and this would apply to any one of us who seek to serve the Lord, prepare, he said, for what he called fainting fits. And that, what he meant by that is that be ready when the Lord uses you, when you experience God's blessing and he uses you in some powerful way, some extraordinary way, some unusual way, he said, be ready. The next thing that's going to happen to you is that Satan is going to attack. The demons are going to attack. Your flesh is going to attack. There's going to be some kind of a great trial that's going to come your way. Now, why is that? It's because God wants to humble you. Because what, what is the thing that's going to happen when you experience all this blessing and the nearness of God and all this power? What's going to happen to you? What's the tendency going to be to become prideful? God used me. God, God did something extraordinary through me. And that means maybe I'm kind of special. Maybe the Lord has chosen me to be his unique and special servant. Maybe God's going to use me for great things. Well, as you begin to soar with those kinds of thoughts, suddenly the Lord goes, and he knocks you back down to earth to humble you. That is where you need to be. In order to be usable by the Lord, you have to be humble. If you become prideful, God will resist you. But if you become humble, he will use you. And so that's why he brings trials in order to humble you. I think the, the, the you know, disciples probably felt pretty special with their basket of bread, but they didn't feel so special out there on the, on the uh, sea as they're struggling in this trial. We need humbly always to rely on the Lord. We are no better after the Lord has used us than we were before. So we need to keep ourselves humble and not rely on our own strength but on his because that is when God is able to use us. So again, we're never more likely to go through a trial that is designed by the Lord to humble us than after he has blessed us by using us in some special way. Now sixthly, the Lord will not only pray for us, but he's also going to come to us in our trials, verses 19 through 20. Then when they had rowed about three or, yeah, rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus will come to us. He came to his disciples on the sea. He didn't just leave them out there by themselves. He came to John when John was banished to the Isle of Patmos. He came to Paul and Silas and also to Peter when they were in prison. The Lord will also come to us in our trials. Again, here's another wonderful promise quoted from the Old Testament by the author to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. He himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. 
What will man do to me? You see, we don't have to be afraid. The Lord will come to us in our trials. The Lord will come to us when it is the right time. I mean, the trial doesn't just begin and end right away. There's a certain amount of time that the Lord wants us to benefit from that trial. The disciples, I don't know if you, if you do the math, then you'll, you'll understand the disciples were out on, these, on the Sea of Galilee rowing this boat for, for at least eight hours. Now, that's one of the reasons why I'm saying that maybe they needed all that food before they went out. I mean, Jesus does strengthen us before he sends us out into the, to, to do the work or to endure this particular trial. They, they began at about sunset, and if you, you know, see what time of the year Passover takes place, and, uh, uh, you know, the sundown was roughly around 7 o'clock. It can't be too, you know, too specific here. And John tells us, or actually Matthew tells us, excuse me, that Jesus came to them at the fourth watch of the night, and the fourth watch was between three in the morning and six in the morning, which means if they started around seven and he came to them at the beginning of the fourth watch, uh, they would have been going for about eight hours, and yet they had only gone three or four miles during that time, really only about a half a mile an hour <laughs> out, on the, out on the sea, okay? Apparently, it took that long for Jesus to teach them the particular lesson he wanted them to learn. Now, the, my point is this. <clears throat> Sometimes it may take us a little while to learn what it is our Lord wants to teach us in our particular trials, but he will come to us when the time is right, when we have learned what it is we need to learn, and, and it may be a little bit longer than we were hoping, maybe a little bit longer than we thought we needed, but it will be exactly the amount of time that we need. And he will come in a way that unmistakably shows that it's him. He came to them walking on the water. Now here's further evidence that Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah because who else can walk on water? Only God can do it. Only by the power of God can one do something that is completely contrary to the laws of nature. When he comes to us in our trials, he will come to us in a way that shows who it is. Now, one thing we also need to, to acknowledge here is that when he comes, we may not recognize him. The disciples didn't recognize him, right? I thought this is one of the most humorous things in Scripture, especially reading from the Gospel of Matthew, because when the disciples saw him, they were afraid. Matthew says they thought they were looking at a ghost and they cried out in fear. You know, here they are rowing out in the middle of the lake trying to get across and suddenly they see somebody walking on the water. I suppose we would do the same thing. It's a ghost. Some commentators suggest that maybe they thought it was the spirit of the one who stirred up the water. Actually, it was, only he wasn't a spirit. He was a physical man walking on the water. Now, when Jesus comes to us in our trials, maybe we're not going to recognize him either. Maybe we're going to perceive him as some kind of a threat. I mean, how often do we, when we're faced with trials, do we think that that trial has actually been brought about by something that is evil, uh, perhaps by the devil rather than by God? Again, realizing that God will sometimes use the devil and the demons and he'll use our flesh and he does use evil for good purposes. Understanding that to be true, how many times do we blame, as it were, the kingdom of darkness rather than understanding this is something that God has brought into our lives and we're afraid of it rather than doing what James tells us we ought to be doing, counting it all joy when we encounter various trials. Perhaps we haven't yet learned to recognize God's hand, even as the disciples didn't recognize Jesus when he came either in the trials that he sends or in his deliverance, that this came about also by the Lord. God delivered me. Regardless, the Lord is not going to leave us to be afraid when he comes to us. When the disciples cried out in terror because they saw this, uh, this spirit or this man walking on the water, Jesus didn't leave them in that. He didn't just say, well, I, I guess they misunderstand who I am. I better take another route because I don't want them to think that I made them afraid, Jesus immediately comforts them. And he speaks to them. And he says, it is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus speaks comfort to us when he comes to us in the middle of our trials. Now finally, <clears throat> the Lord 
will use these trials to bring us to the desired destination. He will either bring us to different levels of, of spiritual uh, maturity or ultimately he is going to bring us to heaven. And here's an interesting comment that John makes that the others don't mention. He says in verse 21, So they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. As soon as they brought him into the boat, they arrived at their destination. <laughs> they were probably thinking, why couldn't we he have gotten onto the boat a little bit earlier? You know, eight hours of rowing. And as soon as he gets on the boat... They arrive at their destination. The trial was over. The lesson was learned. Now again, the disciples were working very hard to obey Jesus and they just couldn't seem to complete the task. But as soon as he came aboard, the work was suddenly done. They just needed, apparently, to learn that lesson and to trust him. Now again, if you belong to the Lord, if you are trusting Jesus Christ, turning from your sins, relying on him alone to get you into heaven. Even though you're going to have to face many different trials, you can know that you're going to reach your final destination. Jesus has told you that he will get you there. All you have to do is trust him. Here's a marvelous promise in John 10, verses 27 through 29, that reminds us that if we're trusting Jesus, we will, in fact, make it to heaven. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. By the way, that's one of the indicators you're one of Christ's sheep, is that you follow him. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of of the Father's hand. Jesus says if you hear the voice of Jesus Christ, if you hear his voice, and you respond to him in faith and repentance, if you follow him, that he will give you eternal life and you will never perish, which means you will arrive in heaven. He will make sure that you do. So whatever trial you happen to be faced with now, and each of us is faced with not, probably not just one trial, but with various trials of various difficulties of assorted kinds. Know that the Lord is the one who has brought this trial into your life. Know that the Lord has brought it into your life for good. Know that the Lord is praying for you as you go through them. And know that the Lord is going to come to you before long and bring those trials to a good conclusion. Ultimately, the Lord is going to bring you to glory. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply these words and to encourage us, especially through them.